I'm Alex Bischoff, and the title of my project was Custom 3D Casting Redesign. So anybody who knows me knows that I'm a huge 3D printing fanatic, and it came as no surprise to anyone that that was going to be the basis for my engineering fair project. So in my abstract, I basically go over everything that I did to get the results that I did, and mainly on here in the next page are the differences between what I found to be 3D scanning and actual physical measuring. So I ended up going with actual physical measuring versus 3D scanning to fit into my essential question, the, especially the cost standpoint of that. Uh, 3D scanning just wasn't, wasn't in the budget and wasn't viable for a engineering fair project or in the future. Um, so basically how I did it was I took a full finger length measurement uh, in millimeters with digital calipers, and then I plugged that into my Excel spreadsheet and I get a segment length, which I then draw onto the finger and get planes. You can see the, draw the lines on the finger up above there. And I put it on planes spaced apart by that amount. And then I take the digital calipers again and do the X and the Y measurements for each spot on the finger, which then gives me an ellipse, which I can put on those planes and then loft together to create something like that. And then after making it lighter, but still keeping the strength involved like that. And the strengths are uh, where I got most of my data for the results. So I can get the KSI ratings and the Von Mises stress and everything like that. And I can analyze how it will work in the real world. And then here it is in the real world being printed out. Um, you can see that it does fit pretty well on my finger. And I do think that I created a lower cost alternative to 3D scanning and creating custom orthopedic casts for fingers and eventually for other body parts as well. Hi, I'm Alyssa and my project is the effect of acid rain on seed germination. Here's my abstract. My background for this research is to find out acid rain's effects on seed germination because not much research has been done in the field of study and my purpose was to find out the effects that acid rain has on seeds. Um, my hypothesis was if a solution with a pH of either 3, 4, or 5 was added to pinto beans and it will slow down germination compared to the controlled distilled water. The methodology was I got three solutions of 3, 4, and 5 of with pHs of those and then I saturated cotton balls to them and placed the pinto beans and put them into a dark cabinet and every two days I measured and this lasted for one week. Here are the results I got from the four days of measurements. And that graph right there is the average of each of these measurements and as you can see distilled water grew significantly more than the other three pH levels. These results show that the more stick the solution, the seeds will have a longer germination time and will grow shorter. Other experiments in this study have gotten the same results, um, so possible errors may have been uneven distribution, but I don't think that would have affected the results very much. Um, in conclusion, it, the results from this experiment show that acid rain is not harmless and it has negative effects on seed germination and seeds do not germinate faster with a lower pH actually does the opposite of that. And the hypothesis from this was accepted. And by learning this, we can, farmers can learn how to better uh, protect their crops from the acid rain to get the largest yield. Here's my references, thank you. Hi, my name is Annika. I'm in the category of plant sciences and my project is spotted lanternfly deterrent. Spotted lanternfly is an invasive species that has wreaked havoc on the environment. According to a Penn State study, spotted lanternflies are costing the Pennsylvania economy about $50 million and eliminating almost 500 jobs a year. This striking statistic shows why we need to better understand the spotted lanternfly and how to effectively control their numbers in order to better maintain nature, people's jobs, and the economy. The research question asked, was will spraying natural oils on trees infected with spotted lanternflies decrease the number of spotted lanternflies and act as a deterrent? The hypothesis for this experiment is that the trees sprayed with tea tree oil will have le the least amount of spotted lanternflies and will be the most effective deterrent. 
After conducting this experiment, the data showed that the trees sprayed with lavender oil had the most lanternflies, and the control trees, as well as the trees sprayed with tea tree oil, had similar amounts of lanternflies. This demonstrates that the essential oils have little effect in detracting lanternflies. Lavender oil attracted the lanternflies most, so by using this oil to attract the lanternflies and capture them with an alternate method may prove effective in controlling spotted lanternfly numbers. Here are some of the pictures of the data that was collected during this experiment. You can see in figure one and figure two, in figure one, that this is just the original tree and then the tape is up here. In figure two and figure three, it's when the tape has been ripped off after a week's time setting and all the lanternflies are caught. Here are some of the results and the graphs that I made as well as the tables and my conclusion and my sources. Thank you. My name is Ariana Vanderwall and my science fair experiment was to test the effects of temperature on crystal growth. The experiment falls under category chemistry 3. Crystals are known to need an atmosphere that is dark, wet, and most importantly one that maintains stable temperatures throughout the development. The purpose of this project is to find what environmental temperatures can achieve a crystal with the highest quality morphology, clarity, and size. Going into this experiment, it was hypothesized that if crystals' growth needs a stable atmosphere, then room temperature environment will grant the highest chance of success. The experiment was arranged to last a 30-day time period where crystals will grow in three different temperatures, one placed inside a refrigerator at 2 degrees Celsius, another set out at room temperature at 21 degrees Celsius, and the last one was heated by a black light at 27 degrees Celsius. All three solutions contained 100 grams of aluminum potassium sulfate, dodecahydrate, and 800 milliliters of distilled water, forming a supersaturated solution. After the month has ended, the crystals were then evaluated. The room temperature had clearly produced the highest quality crystal, while the heated one didn't form at all and the chilled one had an unorganized morphology. These pictures on the slide capture a few of the actions taking place in order to produce high quality crystals. These are, er, these are the final products of the three temperatures showing that the heated solution did form, the satisfactory room temperature crystal, and the chaotic chilled crystal. Possible errors that could have affected my experiment could have been caused by an outside source that had entered the solution during the process of heating and cooling, evaporation, and the school's temperature change over the weekends. And there's also a chance that the measurement of the distilled water and alum could have slightly varied between all three beakers. In conclusion, the results of the scientific experiment shows that the best temperature environment is in between 20 to 22 degrees Celsius, which is room temperature. And the research did support my hypothesis on what atmosphere the crystallization process would be most advanced in. My project was sun purification of water with various colored water bottles. This is my abstract. My research question was how does the color of a water bottle affect the amount of E. coli in water after exposure to UV rays? And my hypothesis was that if water is being purified in a purple bottle, more bacteria will die during UV exposure. My procedure was to have four water bottles, one clear, one green, one orange, one purple. I filled them all with distilled water and I added E. coli to them. They were then put into a UV light box and swabbed every 15 minutes for an hour. Here are some pictures of the UV light box, the agar plates, and the bacteria colonies that grew, and the incubator we used. Um, it was found that only two out of the four water bottles had a decrease in the amount of bacteria after UV light exposure, and that was the clear and purple water bottles. Here's a chart showing the numbers. Uh, it was found that the clear water bottle had the highest decrease in bacteria and uh, the purple was the only other water bottle that had a negative trend. The orange and green bottles actually had an increase which uh, shows that they block the UV lights. Um, this went against my hypothesis because it was actually the clear bottle and not the purple bottle that killed the most. And the answer to my research question was, color doesn't significantly affect the amount of E. coli in each water bottle. Here are my references. 
Hi, my name is Ava Wolf, and my project was the effects of eco-friendly and non-eco-friendly products on plant growth, and my project idea is Plant Sciences 4. This project studied the effects of varying, varying concentrations on both eco-friendly and non-eco-friendly products on spider plants. I will not be reading the abstracts if you'd like to read this pause now. I emphasize that products that are non-eco-friendly will have a negative effect on plant growth if it would pollute the soil that they are growing in, and eco-friendly products would have a positive or no effect on the plants. The group was watered on a daily basis with only water. The other plants were watered daily with combinations of 25%, 50%, and 75% products added into the water. The products used in this experiment included two dish soaps, Ajax, non-eco-friendly, and 7th generation, eco-friendly. Two solvents were also utilized, contractor solution, non-eco-friendly, and citrus solution as the eco-friendly version. The width of all the plants were recorded on a daily basis as long, along with visual observations. Solvents at all three concentrations had an immediate impact on the plants. They began to wilt, turn brown, and were completely dead in three days. It took much longer to start to see impacts from the two dish soaps, but eventually both started to wilt and some of the leaves turned brown from all three concentrations. By the end of the experiment, the plants watered with seventh generation did outlive the plants watered with Ajax, but only the plant watered with 25% seventh generation continued to look healthy. Graphs of the height and width of the plants versus the control group, as well as pictures taken daily, show significant impact on both solvents and gradual impact on dish soaps. That was collected daily. And here is a photo of the first day of the experiment and the last day of the experiment. Indicate that not all products labeled as eco-friendly are safe for the environment. Seventh generation was the only product that was labeled as meeting the U.S. EPA safer product standards and the results suggest that this is true. However, the citrus solution that claims to be eco-friendly and mom-approved but this seems to be the case of greenwashing. Greenwashing is when a company deceptively puts eco-friendly claims on its product packaging without having evidence to back up their claim. And the hypothesis was only partially correct as seventh generation did have less impact on the plants, but the citrus solution just looked just as harmful to the plants as its non-eco-friendly version. Here are my sources and thank you for listening. My name is Braden Sorensen and my science fair is titled The Accuracy of Fitness Trackers. I'm a soccer player and go to the gym almost every day and use a fitness tracker to log my goals. I did a lot of reading on the subject and found there was already many studies on fitness trackers and how accurate they are. It is an important study to me but in, to the general public because fitness trackers are a multi-million dollar industry and one in five Americas used a smartwatch or fitness trackers of some style. Uh, in my home, there are four of us, and together we all use fitness trackers. We have three brands we use. Everyone has a different reason or preference as to why they use them, and these are these brands I end up using for my project. Apple Watch, Fitbit Versa 2, and Garmin Venue. Fitness trackers are smart watches, track many different types of data. For my submissions, I narrowed my data down to heart rate readings. My hypothesis is that the higher readings will be accurate or close to rely on the information of your fitness and health goals. I chose three exercises to monitor. I chose to compare the fitness tracker to the two finger manual heart rate count done at the neck for 60 seconds. I found this is the most accurate and the only method more accurate would be the EKG, which is not available for general public comparison. The data from the device was either exact the same as the manual reading or off by single digits which could be the small delay in a setting up to a manual count and timer, which I did supervise the assist assistance to make the time between as short as possible and accurate as possible. I have offered three tables separated by the device showing a heart rate immediately following the exercise completion. It was important to control my environment, so I chose to use the same treadmill for each cardio exercise, the same barbell for strength portion. I control the Fitbit of Fitness Tracker by marking the inside of the band so I had the same tightness or fit each time. I also chose my dominant hand which was my right to wear the device. I used a treadmill that showed my pace at the time so that I could be sure my miles per hour was steady and as close to the same uh, in each demonstration. I was not surprised that the devices were accurate but I was surprised that the devices were almost exactly the same as manual heart rate data which my submission proved. I am personally excited with the result and feel more confident re relying on the data displayed on my fitness tracker. For my science fair experiment, I sought to explore the effects of temperature on BPA leakage. This is my abstract, which just includes details I'll be discussing later, and a little bit of background on bisphenol A. So BPA is big in the production of different kinds of plastics, and there's been a lot of concerns about the safety in regards to human consumption. So what I chose to explore 
were PET bottles, which are the little plastic bottles you probably drink out of every day. And uh, studies have found that these bottles leach BPA even after a producer promises that they're BPA free. And ultimately the determining factor in whether BPA is being leached is the exposure to high um, temperatures. So the purpose of my experiment was to discover whether quantifiable amounts of BPA leak from PET water bottles exposed to varying temperatures. And then my big research question was, how does temperature affect BPA leakage? So I formed the hypothesis. If a PET water bottle is exposed to heat, it will leak more BPA into the water than those bottles ex um, exposed to room temperature or refrigeration. So for my procedure, I purchased three of your typical 16.9 ounce water bottles from the local supermarket. I placed one in the refrigerator, one at room temperature, and another one was placed under a heat lamp as shown below. They were left in their respective conditions for two weeks, and then samples were taken out of each bottle, um, placed into a test tube, and then placed in a spectrophotometer. It was there that transmittance rates were collected, and I also calculated absorbance rates. So the control group in this experiment was the bottle that had been kept in the room temperature environment. Transmittance rates essentially indicate, indicate the clarity of water. So analyzing the samples in the spectrophotometer at seven different wavelengths, I recorded the transmittance rates. And then I also used this formula to explore the absorbance rates. Here are my results, as well as some other uh, materials I used to ensure the quality of the experiment. So my results indicated that there were no identifiable amounts of BPA leached into the water. Um, and these results are consisting with most of the findings of others. If BPA was present in the water, it was at a concentration unable to be detected, making it virtually irrelevant as it would not have an effect on human health. Um, results may have been affected um, by some uncontrollable uh, factors, such as if the water samples were contaminated prior to acquisition, such as being exposed to high temperatures on the way to the grocery store. So um, the conclusions that I reached included that sci uh, scientific uh, community is correct on this issue. Um, BPA in water is generally insignificant, if it even exists. Um, it seems as though varying temperatures do not cause BPDA to leak from PET water bottles, and this disproves my hypothesis, um, as the higher temperatures didn't cause any more leakage. And knowing that BPA is not a large risk in plastic water bottles following this experiment, focus can be shifted to other chemicals um, impairing quality. These are my sources that I cited, and thank you very much for your time. Hi, my name is Brianna Umstead, and I am doing a science fair project in the chemistry category in Mine is the Fourth Project. And the title of my project is Removing Stains on Fabric, the Effect of Enzymes on Laundry Detergent. Here is my official abstract and the topic. This science fair project is about the differences between biological and non-biological detergents. Biological detergents have stain-fighting enzymes in them, and non-biological detergents do not. Non-biological detergents are also chemical-free. Biological detergents contain enzymes that help break down the fatty, greasy, and starchy compounds that are found in some of the most common stains. Biological detergents contain four enzymes, proteases, amylases, cellulases, and lipases. Each enzyme is used for a different type of stain. Proteases remove protein-based stains, amylases remove starches and carbohydrates, cellulases make cotton fabric stronger while removing stains, and lipases break down and remove fat-like stains slides are my methodology slides that you can pause to read as well. It is hypothesized that biological detergent is more efficient than non-biological detergent. The constants in this experiment were 30 minute wash cycles, 3 minutes of stain rubbing time, and similar fabric sizes, 2.5 inches by 3 inches. The two types of detergent used were Tide brand. The Tide unscented original was used for the biological detergent, and the Tide simply clean and fresh unscented detergent was used for the non-biological detergent. Slides are my result slides. The results indicated that the biological detergent was the most effective detergent used on the various types of stains in this experiment. These stains were consisting of mustard, fruit juice, ink, and grass. Mustard was used for a tougher to get out stain. Fruit juice was used for a juice stain. Ink was used for a nearly impossible stain to get out. And grass was used to represent an outdoor stain. Both types of detergent were able to remove the stains, but there was a clear difference in the two. The befores and the outcomes of each of the stains. Here is the results. This slide is an interpretation of the results, and you can pause to read this slide as well. In conclusion, the 
The hypothesis for this experiment was correct because the biological detergent was more effective on all the stains being treated in this experiment. Hello, my name is Brooklyn Hambrick. My project ID is PlantScience5.Brooklyn and my project title is The Effect of Potassium on Zinnia Growth. I decided to forego with this experiment because I love plants and gardening and then through some research I found that potassium is one of the three key nutrients needed by plants for them to properly function and grow. So I decided to test and see if a plant's health would be improved by adding this nutrient to it. I also decided to use zinnias as the plants because they are easy to manage and fast growing. I hypothesized that by adding 10 milliliters of potassium sulfate and 5 milliliters of distilled water would cause an increase in biomass and present a noticeable health difference. So then for the procedure, I prepared 10 different pots for three test groups and one control group. And then the control group of zinnias received 15 milliliters of only distilled water. And then the low group received five milliliters of potassium sulfate. The medium group had 10 milliliters. And then the high group had 15 milliliters of only potassium sulfate. And then at the end, the collective biomass of each group was recorded. Unfortunately, all my plants died by the end of the first dose being distributed, but these results from the experiment brought me to the conclusion that too much of the salt solution was added to the soil. So the salt dehydrated the soil and the roots clogged up, which prohibited the plant from utilizing the given water. If I were to do the experiment over, I would need to decrease the amount of potassium sulfate given to each plant but on a more positive note, this outcome did lead to the exploration of salt runoff. So I started to consider more of the negative effects that salts have on plants and how they may enter the soil through runoff. Uh, many lessons and new information were able to be uncovered through this experiment, despite the unexpected outcome. Thanks so much for listening. The Effect of Various Weed Killers on Plant Growth by Charles Luce. The first slide is the abstract slide, which shows over the point of the experiment as well as how to execute the experiment and the results and how these results can be applied in the real world. The next slide is the research question slide, which goes over some background information that is key in understanding the lab, as well as the research question and the hypothesis. The next slide is the first part of the methodology, which gives you the procedure, a sequential list on how to complete the lab. The next slide is methodology continued, which explains how the data is collected, how to interpret the data once it is collected, as well as the control group and any variables being used in this lab. The next slide is a before and after picture slide. It shows on the left the grass before any treatment has been done to it, and on the right the grass after being treated with either herbicide or water for 10 days. The next two slides are the charts I used for in Excel to gather all my data. The top section is the grass height, and the lower section is the change in grass height. There are four groups, Control, Roundup on this page, and on the next page, Homemade and Ace Brand. The next slide is interpreting the results. This slide is used to explain the results, as well as any possible errors that could account for those results, such as cross-contamination or human error. The next slide is the conclusion. This slide explains the results and how they answer the research question, as well as any future applications for my work. The last slide is the reference, which cites any information or articles I used in gathering data from my lab. Hello, this is Chloe Ryan's Science Fair project about food lifestyle changes and their effects. My research question was how can changing my food lifestyle make me feel? I used the procedures as follows. Obtain a specific food for the diet, make meals that align with the diet, eat in the style of the diet for two weeks, and record how I felt at the end of each day. That is what I did every day for all the two weeks. And I found that each diet made me feel similar, but varied in how they made me feel in different ways. So I thought the carnivore diet made me feel bloated the most, but that was pretty much the most varying thing I found on my data charts. I thought they all had their pros and cons in their own ways, and I think it's up to the consumer about what they want to sacrifice in order to gain something else. I thought that I was correct about my hypothesis that the carnivore diet was the most difficult and the vegetarian was 
uh, difficult to keep me full. My research question was, how can changing your food lifestyle make you feel? And I wanted to test out different food lifestyles to see which one could be the easiest or most attainable for people to follow. There is little known about the carnivore diet, which made it harder to, for me to test it, but the vegetarian diet was well known, and there are very many ways of doing it, such as the lacto-ovo or pescatarian or other things. The Mediterranean diet is more of a general style of eating rather than a set way, so they use more of a like food chart or food pie, whatever you want to call that. I thought that I was trying to figure out if changing your food eating habits can make you feel differently in a positive or negative way. I also hypothesized that the carnivore diet would be the most difficult and hard to stick to, and I believe that the vegetarian diet would not be filling, and then I thought that the Mediterranean diet would be the easiest for me to follow. I began to research each diet and I understood the essentials of each diet and understood what they required and did not allow. I planned all the foods that I wanted to eat and the guidelines I needed to follow. And then I, f I followed the diet f each day for two weeks, making every single meal and I recorded how I felt after each day and tracked my water and sleep. I collected lots of data on my hour of sleep my tiredness level, my water intake, and energy level. Each day I controlled the type of food I ate, which was my control variable. I ate only what was allowed and nothing else. Each day I made sure to drink sufficient water, varies day to day, but mostly that was something that I kept pretty consistent. Here's some of my results that I have on my data here. As you can see, I put my days here, lasting for 14 days on each, and I have my water tracked in ounces here, and my hours of sleep with hours and minutes, and my tiredness level for all of them, my bloated level for all of them, and my energy level for all of them. Tiredness level was ranging from 1 to 5, and 1 being the most tired, and 5 being not at all, and bloated level being one not at all and five most and energy level same thing. Here are some of the averages that I took at the end of each diet. Um, the most notable to, uh, um, to show is the bloated level right here. I had hypothesized, had figured that the carnivore actually would be the most bloated, and I do agree with that. Actually, I think the vegetarian was not as bloatedness, and I'm unsure why it is coming up that way, so I would like to override that. And mostly everything else is pretty standard. I felt my tiredness and energy was pretty standard throughout, and my hours of sleep were pretty standard as well. I can also infer that these were my personal results and that they are subject to me. So many other people might feel differently about these diets or they might not, um, their carnivore diet might not give them bloating or the vegetarian might, but this is sort of my pretty consist consensus about what I had felt. And um, I, like I said, I would like to override that I thought that the bloating was more on the carnivore diet, and that was one of the mistakes I um, happened in my data tracking. So my data also varied each day because I did feel different ways each day. Not every day is the same for me. Sometimes I felt lazy, sometimes I didn't want to get out of bed, sometimes I felt sad, sometimes I didn't feel motivated to eat lunch or to get up and eat breakfast, so or sometimes I just ate too much, so that definitely could vary my data and how I feel as well. Overall, I felt that the way that uh, my diet feels um, to me can not be the same for everybody. Like I said, it's subject to each person and each individual, but I discovered that all diets can be very attainable, and they might make you feel different ways, but they might all be worth it in the end. And I think that there were pluses to all of them, which I'll mention that the carnivore diet made me feel full after each meal, 
but I began to miss other foods like breads and cereals, which I was unable to have. I also found that the Mediterranean diet was very enjoyable for me. I liked eating seafood, which I don't always get to, and I always thought that it was a nice balance between having seafoods and having other healthy foods as well, and limiting meat also made me feel good. I thought the vegetarian was also good because I felt that I was sort of saving the environment by not eating meat, but then again I did miss meat in some situations, and it was also hard to keep me full because meat is actually a very good um, filling protein. And here are my references. Thank you for watching. Bye. Hi, my name is Claire. My project is bacteria retention and cloth versus surgical masks. I won't be reading the abstract, so please pause now to read it. Information known about masks is relatively new because COVID-19 happened very recently. Two studies that aid in the knowledge of masks overall say that surgical is the better option. Therefore, my hypothesis is that cloth masks will retain the most bacteria. My hope is that this will provide insight as to which mask is more effective in combating the COVID-19 virus. First step in methodology, agar and distilled water were mixed in beakers and brought to a boil. It then went into the autoclave and was poured onto plates to make 36 plates of agar. Next step, the bacteria was then reactivated, which in this case was staph epidermis. Next is the inoculation of three cloth and three surgical masks, which means they will be infected with staph epidermis. The masks are divided into 12 equal sections and 20 microliters of bacteria will be pipetted onto each section. 40 microliters of distilled water will then be pipetted on each section of each mask. Two surgical and two cloth will be stored at room temperature in a cabinet for 24 hours after being inoculated, while the remaining one surgical and one cloth will be stored in for seven hours in the same cabinet. For the 24-hour mask, one cloth and one surgical will have distilled water quickly squirted over each row before being pressed onto the petri dishes in order to make it a wet transfer. The other pair of 24-hour masks will not receive water to make it a dry transfer. Both of the seven-hour masks will be wet transfers. The petri dishes will then be incubated for 48 hours at 30 7 degrees Celsius after the masks are pressed. The bacteria colonies will then be counted using a colony counter. These next two slides display the results with the average number of bacteria colonies written below each category of mask. This bar graph is displaying the results. On the right is a list of the average number of bacteria colonies from low to high. Please pause to read the full interpretation. In summary, the majority of the surgical masks had the most bacteria colonies counted, which therefore refuted the hypothesis. It is concluded that surgical masks retain the most bacteria versus cloth masks. Therefore, wearing a surgical mask poses a greater risk of infection than wearing a cloth mask because viruses like COVID-19 can survive on bacteria. Attached are my references. Thank you for listening to my presentation. The effect of various solutions on the life of cut flowers. The idea of this project is to determine what keeps cut flowers alive the longest by watching them over a course of time. Each set of flowers will have a different solution mixed in with the vase and a control group. The data will be shown using two separate graphs to show how long it takes for the flowers to wilt and how long it takes for them to lose the color. The research question being asked is will a homemade solution preserve a flower as long as this flower preservative packet will? There are many mimic household ingredients that are combined together to make a flower preservative, but they may not all work. I have chose this research topic because whenever I buy flowers or someone gifts them to me, they usually f die fairly quickly. The methodology behind this is to take three exact groups of flowers and put them in three of the same exact vases. One vase will conserve the flower preservative packet that comes with a bouquet of flowers, and the other will have bleach, sugar, and lemon juice all mixed together. And the last group will have just solely water. It will be shown using two different graphs one for the color of the flower and the other for the fragility of the flower. I'll show that the flower preservative packet that comes with the bouquet of flowers made the flowers last the longest. The flower packet is a superb choice in this case. Results are interpreted as a homemade solution containing lemon juice, bleach, and sugar will not prolong the life of a cut flower, nor will just putting flowers in solely water. The thing that prevents flowers from dying is a flower preservative packet that is given with the bouquet. Conclusion, while the flower preservative packet is made from a sugar, acidifier, and biocide, just as a lemon, sugar, and bleach is, the flower preservative packet is the better choice than a homemade solution. A mimic flower preservative won't keep the flowers along, alive as long, and neither will putting them just in water. Hi, my name is Desiree Martin, and my project is titled Correlation Study Between Wisp Species and Microbial Growth. It's my abstract. Research question. 
My experiment was conducted because I wanted to figure out which wood is more susceptible in a household against bacteria. In this experiment, pine, oak, and spruce wood samples were tested against one bacterial strain to see which one would fight off bacteria better. Methodology. To start, 23 grams of nutrient agar was measured out and placed into one liter of hot distilled water. The agar was then mixed and placed in the autoclave for seven hours. After the seven hours, the agar mixture was taken out of the autoclave and poured into 50 different plates of petri dishes. After the petri dishes were poured into, the petri dishes were then placed in the refrigerator and cooled overnight. Later on, the bacteria, the wood setup was made for the bacteria. Each wood was sectioned into three different sections, a zero minute section, a one hour section, and a six hour section. Approximately 50, 10 millimeters of stap epidermis, epidermidis was then distributed in each section. After each distribution, the bacteria was then swabbed and at its given time. This is my picture. Results. The results came back and oak wood actually had the least number of total bacteria colony counts. Pine wood had the second least and spruce had the most with 444. Graph representing that. These are pictures of the first swab against the third swab for each wood. Interpretation of the results. After the colony count was done, uh, the data illustrated that pine wood was the most acceptable to the bacteria and oak wood came in second place, while spruce wood did the opposite of what it was supposed to do. It actually increased in the bacteria colony count. So, the, so spruce wood actually lacked antibacterial properties. In conclusion, pine wood had the best susceptibility, spruce wood lacked antibacterial properties, and oak wood did present positive antibacterial properties. Hello, I'm Destiny Yang, and my project was effective olive leaf extraction on bacteria. Olive leaves may have many health benefits. They're used to cure many diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and can increase your metabolism. The purpose of this research was to determine if olive leaf extraction would serve as a variable, to, a variable source to kill bacteria. The rationale for the research was to help get rid of bacteria rather than using rough chemicals that are common ingredients contained in cleaning products. The mo the motivation of this study was to gain a better understanding of how bacteria and olive leaf extraction don't work with each other. Olive leaf extraction tends to work better for health issues rather than killing bacteria. The experimental variable of, is the olive leaf extraction with bacteria, also known as E. coli, being used as a control. The hypothesis was that 25% of olive leaf extraction would get rid of bacteria. After conducting bacterial plating, the hypothesis was refuted. The data was that was collected illustrates that there is not a direct correlation between bacterial and olive leaf extraction. This experiment yielded a 0% bacterial kill rate with an olive oil extract. In conclusion, olive leaf extraction would only help with health issues rather than on bacteria. Oops. Will 25% of olive leaf extraction kill bacteria? Olive leaves are shown to have many health benefits and can cure a lot of diseases. It's originated from countries like Greece, Morocco, and Tunisia. The leaves that were worn by athlete, athletes in ancient Olympic, Olympic Games and the olive branch has traditionally been a symbol of peace in the 1800s. The plant was used to treat malaria, other studies have used olive leaf extraction against bacteria and proved that they both don't have a correlation with one another. The purpose of the experiment was to find out if olive leaf extraction would kill bacteria, trying to find out if 25% of the extraction would work. On Thursday, January 21st at 7 o'clock a.m., I made the agar. I used agar powder, distilled water, a self-stirring rod, hot plate, and a beaker. I added 23 grams of agar agar powder into a liter beaker, added one liter of distilled water into the beaker, added a self-stirring rod, and placed the beaker on a hot plate at a high heat. I waited until it boiled, and when it boiled, I let it boil for one minute. Added the agar mixture into two 50 milliliter beakers, and I covered both of the beakers with tin foil, and I put it in the autoclave. The same day at three o'clock p.m., I gathered 20 petri dishes and placed them into, into two rows, two by ten. 
I gather the agar from the outer plate and I place agar into petri plates, slightly covering the bottom of the plate and slightly opening the plate to put the agar in. I, repeat, I repeated this step until all 20 plates were filled. I waited until the agar hardened and I flipped the plates upside down to stop condensation from falling. I placed the plates on a tray and I left it in the refrigerator. And on the side here, you can see that um, you can see five petri plates that I placed in that I placed in the fridge, and um, I also showed the hot plate that was used to heat up the agar mixture. On Monday, January 25th, I created the dilution of olive leaf extract. I added 25% of olive leaf extract to a test tube and then added 75% of distilled water to the 25% using a pipette. And I repeated that for the same for 50% of olive leaf extractions. Um, the next day on January 28th at 7 o'clock in the morning, I used tweezers to pick up sterile discs and I dipped them into distilled water. I placed discs saturated with water onto a petri plate and inoculated them with the E. coli. I repeated again for distilled water in a new plate and I, using tweezers, picked up a new disc and dipped into 25% olive leaf extract, placing a petri date petri dish inoculated with E. coli, and I repeated the steps 3 to 4 for a total of 10 plates for each dilution. Then I placed um, the plates in the incubator at 37 degrees Celsius for 48 hours, and, and once I was done, I would measure the diameter of the colony. And on the picture here, you can see the E. coli that was used and the petri plates in the incubator. Here are my results after 48 hours. You can clearly see that um, there are no bacteria on the petri plates, there are no colonies shown. Uh, this failed, I failed to prove my hypothesis correct. Although on the 25% of, of olive leaf extraction, you can see that there's a little bit of colonies, but that's only shown on one out of the five that were done. Um, you can clearly see on the 50% that there were also no bacteria, same with the distilled water. The olive leaf extraction did not work, neither did distilled water. There were no bacteria colonies shown, meaning that the olive leaf extraction had no correlation with the E. coli. With the 25% of extraction, there was a little bit of a colony shown on one of the peachy dishes, but others show none. Some possible errors could have been being surrounded with a lot of bacteria and not cleaning properly. Also, olive leaf extraction and bacteria don't correlate with one another. Olive leaf extraction benefits health issues rather than kills bacteria. Rather than using bacteria, using a human body would be another alternative to this research project. After concluding olive, olive leaf extraction won't kill bacteria, another project would be used on humans or animals to see if it will decrease health issues. The results proved the hypothesis wrong and the research question wrong. Here are my references. Yeah. Powering small appliances with solar cells in remote locations with my subtitle as Finding Effective Electrolyte Concentration in Cupric Oxide Solar Cells, which made sense after I changed my procedure. Here is my abstract, please pause to read. It is hypothesized that the higher concentration electrolyte solution in the copper oxide photovoltaic cells will increase its voltage output. The purpose was to see how voltage output works with common materials that are typically used for solar energy. The procedure was to create three different types of saltwater electrolyte solutions with copper plates that created a cupric oxide coat in order to test the voltage output. I used Logger Pro to test the voltage output of all three of the saltwater electrolyte solutions, which was 0.15 molar as my control, 0.30 molar, and 0.45 molar. As you can see, the picture on the left, I'm creating a cupric oxide plate. I ran two trash trials for each cell for each molar concentration to determine my results. I created two solar cells, as you can see in the picture, to have more test trials, but due to manufacturing issues with the copper, the copper inconsistency due to constant heating and all of the cuprous oxide coating on each plate differently. Since copper is a transition metal, it is difficult to achieve the same cupric oxide, copper 2 oxide, on the plate. There were multiple different colors present, which included copper 1 and copper 3 oxide.
These results mean that the correlation between electrolyte concentration and voltage output was not supported in the data collected for cell B and cell B only. Cell A, the 0.45 molar for both trials, had a higher voltage output, but on the other hand, with cell B in the first trial, 0.15 molar had a larger voltage output, but trial 2 with cell B, which was 0.45 molar, had a larger voltage output. These results were due to manufacturing inconsistency. As you can see in the picture, the multiple different colors within the Cooper oxide plate are present. Here are my results straight from Logger Pro. This is more about my interpretation of results, which you can pause and read. In conclusion, for the most part, my hypothesis was successful with the 0.45 molar being the highest voltage output, except in the first trial for cell B, where 0.15 molar had a higher voltage output. For more results, future testing can be done. And here are my references. Microbiology 5, um, a say of antimicrobial hand soaps. Do people really know what they're putting on their hands? Do people really know what soaps or sanitizers work best? Well, the experiment I conducted is going to answer those questions. The two bacteria I used was Staph and E. coli. The three chemicals I used was Trichloroquine, Benzene Chlorine Chloride, and 70% isopropyl alcohol. The control of the experiment was distilled water. My research question is how do antimicrobial hand soaps affect the growth of E. coli and Staph bacteria? And my hypothesis was that 70% isopropyl alcohol would work best to clean the bacteria due to the concentration of the alcohol and the strength of the chemical. So the methodology was to create plates and then um, swipe on the bacteria and then dip uh, little discs into the chemical and place in the middle. Then I'd let the plates sit in a warm area for a couple days and then I'd come back and measure the diameter of the dead bacteria zone. So this slide is the E. coli testing for each plate and its chemical and then I did the exact same for the staff. Uh, these are the average. In the staff testing, benzene chlorine chloride came out on top with an average of 19 millimeters, and for the E. coli, just closing came out on top with an average of 18 millimeters. Here's the individual results um, from each plate for the E. coli testing, and this is the staff. The results, um, even though benzene chlorine chloride came out on top with a higher average out of the two testings for each bacteria, I concluded that trisoclosin would be a better option due to its high average and it was also more consistent than benzene chlorine chloride. I did have some trouble throughout my experiment with the benzene chlorine chloride plates with the staff. Um, I had to redo them because there was some cross contamination, um, the rings were not coming out clear. So we had to redo this. In conclusion, just a close-in, uh, I think is the better option out of the three chemicals um, due to its higher average of the dead bacteria zone and its consistency. And here are my this. Hi, my name is Haley Seyford, and no, I did my science fair project on the effect of vitamin C degradation of orange juice over a three-week time period. I drink a lot of orange juice, and that's kind of how I take in most of my vitamin C, and I know a lot of people are also like that. So I wanted to see if uh, the degradation of vitamin C in orange juice really affects how much you're taking in. So some background information that you got to keep in mind. Vitamin C degrades in orange juice um, by temperature, HMF contents, PEF applications, and sugar preservatives. And so basically, they could either determine whether it's going to degrade slower or faster. So my hypothesis is that vitamin C in the original orange juice will degrade by 0.016 grams each week and 0.047 grams in the calcium orange juice each week. So basically, I titrated orange juice once a week for three weeks to see how much degraded within that three week period. And then I titrated a standard based solution to get my equation at the end. So basically on the right photo is the calcium orange juice after it had gone through titration. And then on the left is the original orange juice after it went through titration. And for the first week to the second week, the original lost 0.08 grams of vitamin C, whereas the calcium lost 0.033 grams of vitamin C. And from the second week to the third week, the original lost 0.024 grams of vitamin C and the calcium lost 0.06 grams of vitamin C. And then the graph shows so the black is the original, the white is the calcium, and shows you the degradation of vitamin C through the three-week period. And then the chart of data shows the data that I collected from each trial throughout the weeks. So basically, um, it, 
vitamin C, the degradation of orange juice doesn't really affect how much you're taking it because it's so small. Um, my hypothesis was rejected because on average 0 0.016 grams of vitamin C per week degraded in the original and then the calcium it lost 0 0.047 grams of vitamin C. Thank you for watching. Hello, I did my research project on the effect of milkweed on insulation and I became interested in this topic upon discussion with a teacher about an article that I read covering how milkweed has become an increasingly relevant, sustainable, and vegan material along with its important and more well-known role as a habitat for the monarch butterfly population. View my abstract and moving on to the background information, my research question was, is milkweed floss capable of insulating equally effectively or more effectively compared to other common insulating materials such as wool and goose down? And the purpose of this was to see if prior experiments claims that milkweed floss is six times warmer than wool are actually true, and understanding that if these claims are true, that milkweed floss and milkweed as a whole may be planted more often and this increased demand may positively benefit the monarch butterfly population as milkweed is an important piece of their habitat. Proceed on to methodology. The procedure is relatively simple, just placing a consistent amount of boiled water, 200 milliliters, into a bowl and then covering that with a wire rack and then covering the wire rack with the desired material for the trial, be it goose down, milkweed, wool, or nothing in the case of the control. And then over the course of eight hours, when a towel is covering the experiment, recording the temperature, but eventually for the sake of data analyzation, this time period was shrunk down to three hours because eventually the data did start to level out between all trials, including the control. Here was exactly like the other trials, just missing an insulator on top of the wire rack. And then the thermostat temperature and location were held constant for all trials, and the mass of the insulating materials were held constant with each measured at two grams per material. We see some snapshots of the experiment setup. We can see a nice graph of all the results. We can see that the control slowly starts to allow more heat out of the bowl, and we can see that milkweed is allowing the least amount. Rotation of results that milkweed is not six times warmer than wool, but did perform better than all of the other materials tested. Results support the hypothesis and here are the references. My name is Ayala Nisley and the title of my project is the effect of localized vibration therapy on the recovery of a target muscle. The purpose of this research was to determine whether localized vibration therapy is an effective treatment of delayed onset muscle soreness and which frequency of vibration therapy reduces symptoms of DOMS the most. Important vocab to note is eccentric exercise, the lengthening of a muscle under a load, delayed onset muscle soreness, soreness that is a result of eccentric exercise, and localized vibration therapy, vibration directly applied to a relaxed muscle or tendon. The procedure included making scales to measure all three symptoms, create a workout plan targeting the hamstring, conduct an initial workout, rate pain, tautness, and fatigue every two hours, repeat these steps adding different frequencies of vibration therapy. The scales I used range from 0 to 10 with markers in between and descriptions of the numbers. These are photos from the experiment and experimental equipment. The results pertaining to pain show that the 33.33 Hz frequency produced the most significant decrease in ratings compared to the control test. Again, this trend was depicted in the graphs of the tautness ratings. The fatigue graphs show that a frequency of 18.33 Hz decreased the rating sharply at first, but that a frequency of 33.33 Hz also reduced the symptom and the decrease was much more gradual. The results of this experiment supported my hypothesis. The 33.33 Hz frequency reduced pain by 36%, tautness by 41.4%, and fatigue by 19.1%. This decrease strongly suggests that localized vibration therapy at 33.33 Hz is effective in treating delayed onset muscle soreness in the hamstring. To further prove these results, several secondary experiments would be beneficial. Possible sources of error include inconsistent time between tests due to scheduling issues, pressure fluctuation during testing, and inconsistency of depth and form during exercise. These are the sources I use for my experiment and background information. Environmental Mechanical Engineering 3, Jaden. Ceramic pot filters their ability to filter drinking water. The abstract of the experiment. The problem trying to be solved is the lack of an inability to attain clean drinking water third world countries. The engineering goal is to find an efficient way to do so. Research has already been done on ceramic pot filters and other methods. Agar plates were first created by the researchers so the E. coli had somewhere to grow. The pot from Missouri S&T was first put through a flow rate test to ensure that the pot could produce a testable amount. 
However, that was not the case, so the pot was soaked in distilled water for 24 hours. Afterwards, the researcher created a 2% dilution of E. coli and ran it through the filter. The water was plated before and after filtration, and those plates were put into the incubator for 48 hours. A 4% dilution was also created by the researcher. To test the results, the before and after plates of each trial were counted for the E. coli colony. The prototype made by the researcher was not finished. The results of the experiment are as follows. Trial 1 had a 90.66% reduction, trial 2 had a 78.4% reduction, and trial 3 had a 92.19% reduction. These were all 2% dilations, and they had an average of 87.08% reduction in E. coli colonies. For trial 4, it was a 4% dilution, but the before plate was a complete one and was uncountable. The afterplate, however, had 198 colony forming units of E. coli. A chart of the results, the plates from the results. The results show that the filters are effective at reducing bacteria. However, the pot in this, in this experiment was not as effective as those in the original. Possible errors include human errors. In conclusion, the research turned out as expected. Hello. So my experiment was a spectrophotometric analysis of a solution filtered by different fabrics. So here's my abstract. So I wanted to figure out what type of fabric could filter a solution the best. Uh, as many people around the world do not have clean water and it would help get rid of pollutants and thing, things in the water, uh, which would be very helpful. So here's my procedure. Uh, I use a Spectronic 20D plus spectrophotometer um, to get all my data. I'm going to use a solution of 200 milliliters distilled water, 100 milliliters vegetable oil, and five grams of soil and we used a magnetic mixer to um, mix it all up so a source of error in my experiment was there was oil that was stuck to the sides of the cuvette that was unable to be uh, removed before each experiment so the first uh, experiment or first data uh, is the most accurate. So uh, the silk fabric was proven to be the most effective at filtering the pollutants out of the solution, uh, which supported my hypothesis. Here are my references. Thank you. Hello, my name is Cameron and my project is on the effect of male versus female dog urine on grass growth. This is my abstract. The experiment is based on the common problem of most dog owners, lawn burn. When a dog urinates, they are excreting nitrogen, which acts as a fertilizer, so too much of it can burn the grass. Females have been pegged as the main culprits for this, but only because of the squatting position they take while urinating. So, it is considered a myth that the urine itself is, is different among male and female dogs. I have two basset hounds, Tucker and Phoebe, and since they're the same breed and size, they were able to help me with my experiment, which was to find out whether male or female dog urine has a greater effect on grass. I cut and sectioned three patches of grass. One was control, one was for female urine, and the other was for male urine, and I provided them with water and light. Now the hardest part of the experiment was collecting the dog's urine with Tupperware containers. I then brought it into school and divided it among the sections. I basically had high, middle, and low sections of urine on the grass. The two ways I measured the urine's effect on grass was by the soil pH and grass color, or in other words, chlorophyll absorbency. I'm unable to go into great detail about how I did this, but you may read my procedure and observe the photos in order to gain a better understanding of how I collected my data. I'll show that the male and female groups had lower pHs and absorbencies. However, the male data was just a little more spread out, so the averages were a bit higher compared to the female data. As you can see in all the graphs, female averages were the farthest apart from the, from the control group. Therefore, it can be concluded that female dog urine has more of an effect on grass. 
This contradicts with my hypothesis that there isn't a correlation between dog gender and the effects of urine on grass. There are very minute differences between the results of only one experiment, so I feel that this conclusion should be taken with a grain of salt. This data could possibly be used for anyone looking to adopt a dog and deciding on whether they want a male or female dog. I wish I could speak more on my topic, but thank you for listening to my abbreviated version. Hello, my name is Leah Kreider, and my science fair project was the effect of aqueous ions on alum crystal growth. Here is the object for this paper. The purpose of this experiment was to determine which water type would result in the largest amount of alum crystal growth. As distilled water was the recommended source to be used, it can be assumed that not many experimenters would choose other water sources. However, this experiment tested whether or not it was even possible to use other water sources and, if so, how this variance would affect crystal growth. The hypothesis for this experiment was that distilled water would, indeed, result in the largest growth by weight. Methodology. The first step was to grow a seed crystal, and then once the seed crystal was grown, it would be suspended in the solution to okay. further grow. Uh, two processes used in this were um, slow evaporation and then um, supersaturated solutions. Here is a picture of the initial setup and then crystals grown. So the result of this experiment was that distilled water um, resulted in the greatest amount of crystal growth. To find these results, the following calculations were made. First, the seed crystal was recorded. After further growth occurred, the new crystal weight was recorded. However, the second crystal could not be re removed from the string it was tied to. Because of this, the crystal had to be crushed and the string removed. The string was then weighed and subtracted from the weight of the second crystal. To find the total growth that had occurred, the original C crystal weight was subtracted from the final crystal weight. The calculations are shown below. So interpretation of results. Um, the results of this experiment, as shown on the previous slide, conclude that distilled water will result in the greatest amount of growth. Any references? Thank you. Hi, my name is Logan Bittner, and my product title is The Effects of Preservers on Mold Growth in Burgers, and my product idea is Microbiology 6, period, Logan. So, I did this project because of how popular fast food is in America, and the purpose was to see if there was a correlation between preservatives on how fast mold would grow and how much would grow. So, my hypothesis was that the fast food burgers would grow mold at a slower rate compared to the organic burger. And I collected a burger from McDonald's and another from Burger King. And then I cooked an organic burger and the meat I got from a local butcher. So basically I let them rest for 24 hours and then I began to track it. So the results after uh, one week was that none of the burgers like had a whole lot of mold on them. Like they had some but not a whole lot. And all the mold was white looking and had a fluffy texture. After two weeks there was a lot more gross on all of them. And after week three, all the burgers were covered in mold. And here is a table that I made in Excel that shows the percent covered on each quadrant of the burger. I split the burgers into four quadrants to track them easier. And one thing to notice is that the organic burger actually had less mold on it than the other two, which was very surprising, which, yeah. And then here is a graph that shows the gross by week and the picture is of the burger king burger which you can notice like the yellow gross which the other two did not have which was interesting and then i concluded that the fast food burgers um did have a delayed effect for the mold growth because the organic burger grew a uh, mold um uh, earlier than the other ones and yeah, so I think that the organic burger being larger than the other two may have caused the organic burger to take longer to grow as much mold as the other two because it didn't grow as much. And there's a conclusion, and here's some of my references. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mallory Klein, and my project is titled Disinfectants Applied to Toothbrushes to Kill Bacteria. I am microbiology project number seven. The abstract. Toothbrushes are a very common spot for bacteria to be found on. 
And my goal for this experiment was to determine a quick, cheap, and easy way to reduce the risk of getting sick from those little bacteria that are found on the toothbrushes. For my experiment, I used three different disinfectants, vinegar, Listerine, and orthodontist approved retainer bright, and I compared them to a control group with distilled water. I asked myself when doing this experiment, is what disinfectants will it take to rid a toothbrush from the household bacteria like E. coli? To construct my experiment, I dipped each toothbrush in the bacteria E. coli. I then let them sit for 24 hours and put them in disinfectants for 15 minutes each. Afterwards, I plated them on the agar in three different ways, which can be described in the picture in the top right corner of this page. Here are some more photos that will describe my procedure. These are my results to my first experiment. As you can tell, the control group had lots of growth and all three of the disinfectants had zero growth. I then tried my second experiment, which is only a five second dip of each toothbrush in the disinfectant, and the results were exactly the same. This allowed me to conclude that the time the toothbrushes were disinfected had nothing to do with the experiment. Though a number of variables could be changed in order to strengthen this experiment, the conclusion is that environmentally friendly and chemical-based disinfectants will reduce the risk of getting sick from bacteria found on toothbrushes. Hi, my name is Mary, and this is the effects of artificial sweeteners on kombucha. So my project was I made three batches of kombucha, one using sucrose, one using xylitol, and one using aspartame. I really just wanted to see if I could make kombucha with um, artificial sweeteners and that it would be able to go with go through the fermentation process. So my hypothesis was that the sucrose batch um, would have the closest to the average pH of kombucha, which is 2.5 to 3.5. So I made the kombuchas and then let them ferment for about three to f or about four weeks. Um, and then every week I measured the pH using a probe and a the sugar levels using a Brix meter. All right, so then after four weeks, my batch with the sucrose and with the xylitol, both were at a drinkable and safe pH level. However, my aspartame did grow mold at the beginning of week three into week four. So then these are just the graph showing the sugar levels throughout the weeks and then the pH levels throughout the week weeks. So I think that the xylitol out of the artificial sweeteners did the best because it is an alcohol sugar and most fermen fermented things um, can also become alcohol such as wine. So in conclusion you can make kombucha using um, artificial sweeteners instead of regular sugar. Um, I think that this could lead to a bigger question of what else can you ferment without using real sugar, and this could also help people who are diabetic or just want to cut out sugars from their diet. And these are my references, and that is my science fair project. Thanks! Hello, my name is William Sensenig, and my ID is Earth Science One Paul. My project is the effect of soil erosion prevention methods on a grassy slope. I became interested in my project when my grandparents had a flooded basement due to soil erosion. I wanted to find a way to prevent the soil erosion from underground so that I did not damage their flower beds. I did some research and found that most soil erosion prevention methods are above ground. I had wanted to try to test the effectiveness of subsurface methods. My hypothesis was, if the erosion prevention methods are successful, then the wire mesh will be the most effective. With the data I was able to collect from my experiments, I created these two tables. For the first table, I calculated the mass of the eroded soil for each container. For the second table, I calculated the volume of the soil that had eroded in cubic inches, then used that to help me calculate the percentage of total soil erosion. The variables of my project were the different materials being used to prevent the soil erosion, the wire mesh, the retaining wall, the string grid, and the underdrain pipe, while a box with no prevention methods was used as a control. 
From my data, I was able to conclude that all of the tested soil erosion prevention methods were successful to varying degrees, and that the wire mesh was in fact the most effective method due to it prohibiting soil erosion below its surface and having increased soil cohesion due to grass root attachment to the material. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Rebecca and my science fair tag is Earth Science 2 and this is the health of streams using biotic index. In this experiment, we were trying to uh, discover which part of the Cocalico Creek watershed was the healthiest. And we used macroinvertebrates and other water quality parameters at four different locations throughout the watershed. Overall, we found that Indian Run Headwaters is the healthiest part of the Coquelico Creek watershed. The background for this is that macroinvertebrates are a very useful bioindicator in that they are very easy for volunteers to use. Volunteer monitoring of streams has been going on for over a century now, and we are just continuing the tradition. We measured four different parts of the Cocalico Creek watershed to figure out which was the healthiest. I hypothesized that the headwaters of Indian Run will be the cleanest because there is the smallest amount of pollution surrounding that area. One of the goals was to see what different factors of the watershed were there. Two of the biggest ones were agriculture and urban areas that have negatively affected watersheds. For the methodology, we measured dissolved oxygen, pH, and the temperature in the water and the air. And then we caught macroinvertebrates by kicking downstream into a D-net. We collected the macroinvertebrates, identified them, and counted them before we released them back into their stream. Here are some of our results. So the percent of force decreased as the drainage area increased. The temperature increased as it went downstream. The biotic index increased from upstream to downstream. And it is important to know that the lower biotic index, the better. There appears to be a correlation between the forest cover and better biotic index scores. As forest cover changes to agriculture and urban influences, the biotic index decreases. This indicates the negative influence by agricultural land and urban land uses on water quality. The Indian Red Headwaters is the healthiest, which makes sense, and it matches with my hypothesis. My research could give insight on streams that have lots of pollution and bad quality. It could help the public or local government to start thinking about how they could help improve stream quality. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Hi, my name is Riley, and my category is Biomedical Health and Translational Medical Sciences. And my experiment was on the effect of different cholesterol lowering agents on pig fat. Here is my abstract on my research experiment and data, and you can pause to read now. This is my background information on cholesterol and what I was trying to determine and my hypothesis. This is my procedure, and you can pause to read it now. This shows what data I was trying to collect and how I was collecting my data. These are my results and a chart showing each pig fat's initial and ending weight and the percentage change to each pig fat. This graph shows each pig fat's weight determining on the seven times I weighed them throughout the month. These are pictures taken by me, the researcher, and you can, they're at their final weights and this is my control group and then goes to apple cider vinegar, then the soy sauce, and at the bottom, garlic paste, and then the niacin. These are my interpretation of the results, and you can pause to read it now. And then this is my conclusion showing that my hypothesis was wrong. And these are my references. Hello, my name is Samantha Earhart, and this experiment tested the effect of road salts on aquatic microorganisms. There's been increased use of road salts, and it's decreasing the quality of stream ecosystems over time. This tests the effect increasing salinity has on microorganisms that compose biofilm. Colonized slides were placed in 
trays that had varying water conductivity levels. A chronic five-day experiment had lower levels and an acute 24-hour experiment had higher levels. At the end of the time period, one slide was randomly selected for each tray to be seen under the microscope and all of the pre and post treatment photos were examined using an image differencing tool. The cellular damage assessment, most of the slides had no cellular damage. However, one of the 750 microsemen level slides had minimal damage, so less than 33% of the viewed area had damage, and all three of the slides at a level of 20,000 microsemen per centimeter had moderate damage, so 33 to 66% of the viewed area had cellular damage. The results from the chronic differencing showed a typical response. There was some loss of biofilm coverage. The solid red dots that can be seen represent loss of clumps of biofilm or where a slide was handled or shadows from pictures. However, the broad speckled areas represent a decrease in the density and coverage of the biofilm. In the acute results, the control slides benefited from no handling and good sunlight, so the difference is actually an increase in coverage. However, the treatment slides had noticeable loss of coverage and density. This would be what is typically viewed after an event like a significant snow melt that has a strong impact on the biofilm. The increased conductivity levels do decrease the quality of biofilm. Salts do negatively affect the life of fresh water, and if this continues to happen, the health will deteriorate faster than people are aware. This experiment tested the effect of homemade antibiotic agents on Escherichia coli. Here's the abstract. The purpose of the ex experiment was to test the effects of essential oils and vinegar on the growth of Escherichia coli, and it was hypothesized that if Escherichia coli were treated with vinegar, they would be the most bacteria inhibited. The procedure was to cultivate the bacteria, plate it on agar plates, and incubate the plates for 48 hours, then measure the diameter inhibited. The control groups were distilled water and vegetable oil, which did not kill off any bacteria, vinegar, a 10% dilution of tea tree oil, and a 10% dilution of thyme extract oil were tested. Additionally, pure tea tree oil and pure thyme extract oil were later tested. The results showed that diluted tea tree oil and diluted thyme extract oil had no effect on the 10 trials, and vinegar was able to inhibit six out of 10 trials, and the three trials for the pure essential oils were able to inhibit every time. Here are the graphs for uh, vinegar and diluted essential oils. Here are the graphs for the control groups and pure essential oils. Here are the pictures for the results. Vinegar had a double ring, which showed its greater inhibition, while the diluted oils were unable to inhibit anything. The results show that vinegar is the most effective at inhibiting the growth of bacteria, and it differed from journal articles which showed that essential oils are effective at inhibiting the growth of Escherichia coli, but this experiment proved that uh, none of the essential oils diluted to 10% were able to inhibit any growth. Errors may have occurred from in in improper calibration and fluctuations in temperature. Additionally, some plates were contaminated likely due to the environment not being entirely sterile. In conclusion, the researcher recommends that households use uh, vinegar instead of essential oils because it was the most effective and also cheapest. Here's the reference page. Oh, my project ID is Materials Sciences 3 Savannah, and my project title is The Effectiveness of Rash Guards on UV Light Transmittance. The reason I became interested in my project is that my family goes boating and to the beach, so I want to know if the rash guard I wear works since I'm out in the sun a lot. For this experiment, I bought the rash guard that I normally use. Did you know that more than two people die of skin cancer in the United States every hour? Skin cancer is a result of DNA modification from harmful UV rays that penetrate your skin, leaving sunburn. A broad spectrum rash guard can be used to help prevent skin cancer. It is hypothesized that the effectiveness of the rash guard will decrease for both UVA and UVB creating more UV intensity after extended hours of exposure and washings. The control group received no exposures, washings, or ocean simulation. Based on the averages for the control group and test five, there is a decrease in UVA intensity. Based on the averages for the control group and test five, there is an increase in UVB intensity. According to the results, the decrease in UVA 
means the more the exposures of fabrics received, the better the fabrics were at protecting against UVA. Therefore, the skin cancer risks decrease. The UV light was 302 nanometers, which falls in the UVB range, so the data gathered from the UVA sensor is not accurate, as accurate. According to the results, UVB increased in UV intensity, meaning the more the exposures the fabrics received, the fabrics were not able to protect against as much UVB coming in. Therefore, the skin cancer risk slowly increased. In conclusion, the hypothesis was proven correct for UVB. However, the hypothesis was proven incorrect for UVA. Thank you. My name is Snow Ying and I am here to present my project about the effect of temperature change on CO2 production and release from soil. And what I wanted to prove was that soil erosion release any carbon dioxide within the rising temperatures. So, for my procedure, I had six tubes filled with dirt halfway with gloves covering it, two test tubes and heat lamp for five to ten hours a day, two in the ice bath with me um, changing the ice daily, and two in the room temperature near the window. So basically, for a few days, I let them sit to adjust, and I would use the CO2 probe to measure the CO2 that was inside the gloves, and this would go on for a few days. And finally, on the last day, I did a 50 to 50 ratio with 20 drops of water and 20 drops of bromothermia blue, and agitating it for 20 times, putting it in the new test tube with the drops and the glove from the tubes that had the dirt. And I place it on there and then shake it up and down, up and down, 20 times. For warm, I said my results were a tint of green. You can still see a blue, but it's a little bit of green. Um, for room temperature, I said it was a light blue, if you look at it a little bit at the bottom. And for cold, I said it was still very dark blue, but you can see a little bit of green lining. I said for cold, um, there is a 0. 0.0036% of CO2. For room temperature and warm, I said there's a 0.0032% of CO2. And I just measured their pH is around 8.1, and there's a medium amount of CO2. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. My project was testing the effectiveness of moisturizers. The objective of my project was to see what moisturizers acted as a barrier and retained moisture for long periods of time. Gelatin was used as a substitution for human skin. Four different moisturizers were used, and to measure the moistness of the gelatin, a moisture meter was used. Dry skin can be caused by many different factors, such as old age, cold and hot weather, and certain chemicals. I cut the gelatin into five sections, then I applied lotion to four out of the five sections. The fifth section was my control group. These were screenshots from my phone of how I recorded the moisture. The picture on the left was the first day of my project. All the gelatin was very smooth and not cracked. The picture on the right is from the last day of my project. The upper left piece had no cracking, but the other three pieces did and the pieces on the right did not absorb the moisturizers as well as the pieces on the left. I went more into depth of how each individual moisturizer performed. Um, these results show that moisturizers retain moisture better if they have hyaluronic acid in them and they do not contain fragrance.